All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Bristol Community College BCC's Phenomenal Rally. <laughs> My name is Amy Blanchett. I am a Phenom board member and also the Phenom Bristol Community College chapter organizer. I am a full-time student here, and I also work at the college. And I started at Phenom three years ago. And I felt like public higher education was a really important cause for me to support. I became an organizer and I have learned a lot along the way with Phenom. I do not have a speech prepared, so I'm going a little off the cuff because I felt like that would be a little more meaningful today. I am, a, like I said, I'm a full-time student. I hold four jobs, three of them are here at the college. I have a son who's 12 years old and I will be transferring to UMass Dartmouth in the fall. I worry when I transfer that student debt will inevitably force me uh, to put a hold on getting a master's degree. It's funny how we're told our entire lives that we have to go to college, that we're, we have to go to college to be something, to be someone. And then we get to college and we're indebted with all this student debt, we're faced with all these access issues. You know, having to juggle being a mom and, and having all these jobs. It's a struggle every day for me, like it is for many students I know at BCC. Which makes, this is why I'm, I'm holding this rally. It's important that we continue to address these issues. With the budget that Governor Charlie Baker has put out, he's once again cut our funding, as he did last year. Last year we had some important programs that were put on the chopping block or were decreased, such as the Gateway to Community College program, which is a program that gives funding to high school students who are at risk of being, or who are at risk of dropping out or have dropped out. They come to BCC, they get college credit while they finish their high school diploma. That funding was cut. We're forced to continuously take these cuts in public higher education but they're never put back. Public higher education is extremely important to those of us who feel like there is no way out, especially in this area where transportation issues are a common problem amongst a lot of us students, food security, homelessness, addiction. We come to Bristol Community College because we realize that in order to get somewhere, higher education is key. However, we're forced to continuously take these cuts in funding. Our fees are increased. It makes us harder to graduate. We go on and we transfer and we accumulate student debt. If you're late one month on a payment, if you defer one month on a payment, they're calling you constantly while you're working and continuing to go to school. And I just, I find it so disheartening that the, the more that you try in life, the more that you're faced with these things. I stand here with all the students for more funding for public higher education because it's important. We need a fully funded budget. We can't accept any more cuts in this budget than we already have. I have a nice rally planned here today. I have a lot of speakers who are going to elaborate a little bit more on that. I'm not going to go too much into statistics because I know that my executive director for Phenom will be doing that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Zach Bears, who's the executive director of Phenom, who will put into words a little more eloquently than me <laughs> the whole f budget funding process. Thank you. Everybody. I'm Zach Bears. I'm the director of Phenom uh, statewide. And my main goal for today, if you were at Advocacy Day, is to sweat less than I did at Advocacy Day. So <laughs> much appreciated. Um, I think Amy really captured one of the main issues that we're facing, not just here at BCC, but across the state. And that is that uh, since 2001, the state has cut funding for our public colleges and universities by 31%. That means that tuition and fees have gone up $4,000 a year on average. Um, I think a lot of people here at BCC 
will recognize that, you know, you're paying $5,000 a year to come here full time or more. You know, that's just the academic cost. That doesn't account for transportation or food or housing. And the effects that that's having on communities across the state are, are dangerous. I mean, there was a report out from the State Department of Higher Education that said up to 25% of students at community colleges either sometimes don't have a home or sometimes can't put food on the table. Um, you know, there are countless stories of people who are going to community college for one semester, out for a year and a half, coming back for a semester, out for a year and a half, or are losing their financial aid from the, uh, from the federal government, or, or just aren't getting the support that they need. And this is being, this is being perpetuated uh, by the state government. The state is cutting funding all the time. This year, in this year's House budget, which has come out today, uh, there is basically no, no increase in funding to the colleges for, you know, the 15th year in a row. There's, there's no more money. And if a college like BCC or UMass Dartmouth or UMass Boston, which we've seen all the crisis that's been going on there, if they want to build a new program or fix a building, they have to charge students and working families to do it. And so basically what we've, we've, we've made a huge change over the last 30 years. 30 years ago, you could go to community college for 200 bucks a semester. Now it's $3,000 a semester. 30 years ago, you know, you could go to UMass Amherst for $1,500 a semester. Now it's 15,000. And, you know, that's, that's because the state used to pay for 80% of our colleges. Now they pay for 20% of our colleges. And that 60% in the middle, I mean, is being covered by people who can't afford it. I, both my parents went to college. I did great in high school. I got scholarships. I have 30,000 in debt. And, you know, if that's true for me, that means that anyone who had to struggle a little bit harder maybe than I did has it even worse than I do. And how many, and one thing I really like to do whenever I talk to people is ask a few quick questions about your experience at the university or the college. And my first question is, how many of you have ever worried about paying for school at BCC? Raise your hand. How many of you are worried that even if you do well here and you transfer out and you try to go to a four-year college, it's going to be even harder to, to pay. How many of you are worried that, you know, your kids or your family are going to have it even worse than we do now? And I would raise my hands to all of those. Um, and the important part is, you know, Amy really captured this, the, the, the difficulties of going here and, and BCC and UMass Dartmouth and any of the RF public colleges. But the other thing on the, on the flip side of that is that we can change this. Um, and that's what Phenom is about. That's what Phenom BCC has been doing here for years now. Um, we, if we come together, and, and it's a unique time because we know what the challenge is now. Donald Trump wants to cut Pell Grants. He wants to eliminate the federal student loan program as it exists today and turn it back over to banks. Um, and you know, the people in this state, Democrats and Republicans on both sides aren't much better. You know, we have a Democrat supermajority in the legislature, you know, even with Republican Governor Baker. The Democrats are the ones who are saying we're not going to increase funding for colleges. And the Democrats are the ones who are saying, you know, students and families should pay more to go to, to public school. So it, it's not a partisan issue. Um, but I think that the Trump phenomenon <laughs> kind of puts it into a unique perspective for everyone. So. What we can do together is the important part, and it's why we're here today. Um, and this is just the start. As some of you I recognize from March 1st when we were at the State House and we had 600 people there rallying for public education, meeting with legislators. Um, you know, the media was talking about it, which is really important. We need to get the newspapers and the TV channels to see us and to understand the problem. We need the fact that 25% of people are going hungry or don't have a roof over their head to not be one story in January. We need it to be a story every week until they fix the problem. And the only way that that is going to happen is if people come together and first off, sit in a room and say, we have this problem. Because I think a lot of people today think that you know, they have it worse off than everyone else or that you know, other people aren't facing these issues. And it's really important for people to come together and just to talk to each other and to recognize that, you know, this is a problem for me the same as it is for you. 
even if I went to school in Western Massachusetts and you're going to school here, this is a statewide problem. And if we come together on our campuses and we talk about the problem and we recognize that there are solutions, um, then we can really make a difference. So the first thing I would say today, there's some flyers over there for the May 20th Rally for Public Education. Um, it's gonna be on Boston Common on a Saturday at two in the afternoon, and we are joining with the, the Teachers Association um, for both the public schools, K through 12, for preschools, for the colleges and the universities. We're joining together with community groups, with church groups, with uh, student groups especially, and even with local bands and, and you know everything that makes our community so great. We're bringing all those people together, we're going down to the common, and we're gonna rally, and we're gonna hope that there's a helicopter above, News, Ch News Channel 5, helicopter looking at that rally and saying, the common is filled with people who support schools and colleges, public schools and colleges. So that's one of the first things you can do. But that's really tough, getting to Boston, taking a whole day. Um, I think we can see, and you know this from being at BCC, people are working two or three jobs. They have kids. They can't come to events like this. They definitely can't take 10 hours out of a day most of the time and go to Boston. So there's some other stuff over there that you can do too. Um, so the House, as I said, they really said to students and families, you're going to pay 6% more next year in tuition and fees. That's basically what they said. But the budget is going to the State Senate, and the State Senate usually has been more favorable in giving the colleges a little more money. So we have over here is a really quick and easy flyer where you can find the information about the budget, learn about it, and then find, uh, email or call your state senator and tell them that it's important to you that they really put money into these, into our schools and colleges. Because um, for all the great work that everyone does here every day, and that's the other side of this, I feel like these conversations are so negative. The reason we want to invest in our public colleges is because they're great, but they need to be accessible to everybody. Enrollments are going down. I don't think that's because people don't want to go to college. I think enrollments are going down because they can't afford to go to college. I think there are a lot of people in Fall River and New Bedford who would love to come to BCC and learn, but it's $5,000 a year is a lot of money for anybody. It's a ton of money, and we need to make sure that the state recognizes that. And the only way we're going to do that is by coming together, having events like this, talking to reporters, talking to cameras, and getting our stories out there. Um, and that's one of the great things that Amy has done. Amy has been so courageous in sharing her story and talking about how being a working student has been difficult. Um, and we need more people to do that. I think one of the things we did a month ago is uh, we testified in front of the House Budget Committee to say we need more funds. Um, and we all wore our debt on our shirts. And I think we need to start figuring out ways where we can show that even though we love our colleges, we love our universities, we also need to fix them. Um, and the easiest way to do that is organizing and coming together, having conversations, and then going out to our friends and our family and saying, this is a problem, here are the facts. You know, that's the other side of this. Once people know the facts, once people know that college is for the cost for students and families is up tens of thousands of dollars, once people know that the state has cut funding by 30% in the last 15 years, they're like, that's wrong. But the problem is most people don't know it. So what we have to do is we need to get together in groups, talk, start talking to each other, and then get that information out into the communities, and then use easy tools like this. So like the email tool that we have to call your state senators, it takes one minute. The letter's already pre-written. If you want to add your story in there, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but we need to make it easy for people to get in touch with the people who are making decisions that are a lot of the times hurting um, students and families and people like me. I mean, I paid personally $20,000 to go to UMass out of my pocket. My parents paid another $20,000 out of their pocket. And I have $30,000 in debt. So, you know, and that's just wrong. It's wrong, and it, it mean, it, we're basically saying, unless you're rich, you, you can't go to college. Unless you're rich, you're not going to have access to opportunities. And in our own state constitution, it says that public schools and colleges should be free. So that's what we advocate for. We advocate for debt-free and eventually free colleges for people who need it the most. Um, and that's what the public colleges are really all about. So thank you for coming today. Um, I really hope that you'll...
get involved, stay involved. I know I recognize a lot of faces here already of people who are already involved. And it's just really important that getting involved, coming to meetings, and then the key part is going back to your communities, going back home to your families and friends and saying, this is a huge problem. Maybe you're not facing it now, but in five years, your son's going to be going to college. So call your legislator or email your legislator because that's the other side of this. Ten phone calls makes a difference on Beacon Hill. So if we can make a thousand, we can really make some change. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. There was one important topic that I had forgotten to touch on when I spoke earlier, and that's that Rhode Island has already talked about free community college. Now the stipulations, it's not inclusive. You have to be coming out of high school and have a good GPA to be accepted. New York is also talking about free community college and eliminating tuition. Massachusetts, on the other hand, we're still behind. We want a debt-free public higher education, but we can't seem to get those bills through to pass. And it's very disheartening. Like Zach just touched on, the access issues of students. I mean, $50,000 in debt, that's a lot. And you attended a public university. So I can only imagine what a private institution would do. Um, Anyway, I'm going to address the next speaker. The next speaker is Mr. Eric Andrade. He's a UMass Dartmouth graduate, and he works for Mass in Motion as a health promotion coordinator for the city. How's it going, everybody? Good. Um, so I wanted to share my story. Um, so I'm no longer a student. I am a graduate of BCC and UMass Dartmouth. Um, and I graduated in 2014 from UMass Dartmouth. I was at BCC for three years before I transferred over. Um, and I got my degree in sociology and anthropology. But then I also ended up with about $30,000 in debt. Um, and it's interesting, in high school, and middle school, and elementary school, your parents and everyone would always say, if you do well in school, you're going to get a free ride to college. You'll be fine. And then high school came, and you had a 4.0 GPA, and you got one $750 scholarship, which probably paid for one semester's worth of books. And that was it. And I immediately had to sign up for loans. And then I went to UMass and had to sign up for another $20,000 worth of loans. And now, two years later, every month, I, if I don't pay my federal student loan on time, I get a phone call, like clockwork, um, asking me why I haven't paid. Um, you know, do I need to be on a repayment plan? It's demoralizing. It makes you feel like you're this other. You can, you're poor. You can't pay. Um, and it's just ridiculous. It's really disheartening. And I work 60 hours a week, and you still have these challenges. So you know, we get into other issues such as living wage, all these things that come out of this just because I wanted to get public higher education. Um, so the, on the flip side of that, on a more positive note, I think that on the state and national level, there should be investment in public higher education. They, you know, our elected officials should be investing in the future of our nation, in our states, in our local communities to really foster the sense that our nation can be great again um, if we invest in our youth, in our people who are out in the communities doing the good work. Um, if it wasn't for my time at UMass Dartmouth, I wouldn't have had the job that I have now with Mass Emotion, going out into the community and trying to prevent disease through improving infrastructure and improving public health and green space and park spaces. Um, that was through an internship through UMass Dartmouth that I got that job, and I'm still there today. Um, so without investing in the professional development of all of us, um, it just makes it harder for our nation to be at a place in the future for our kids and our grandkids and their grandkids to be in a better place to begin with. Um, so I challenge, there's no elected officials here today, unfortunately, but challenge for next year to have this room be packed with way more people um, so we can keep sharing our messages and keep hearing stories and saying we shouldn't be indebting ourselves tens of thousands of dollars and being forced to be quantified into data and being forced to have to repay all this money, we should be invested in. Um, Hardworking, professional people, like, as we all are, you know, many people here are my colleagues, um, and we're doing good work in Fall River, in the state, in the regional uh, area, and across the nation. Um, that should be invested in. If we want to run the nation as a business, like the current administration seems to like to do, let's invest. Let's invest in our future. Let's invest in public higher education. And hopefully we can continue to build on the momentum that everyone has here going. So thank you, everybody.
Thank you, Eric. Eric and I work together on a multitude of community projects within Fall River. And um, one of the statistics of Fall River is that we have a very low rate of people who obtain their GED. We also have a very low rate of people who go on to pursue higher education, bachelors or higher. And it's interesting when you look at the statistics of our city and on the whole southeast area, where the education obtainment is so low and addiction is so high and homelessness is a problem and jobs, we don't have we don't have jobs where people can go after they get their education. Uh, Amazon is, is a great job to start with, but if you go on and you get your bachelor's or your master's degree, you're not going to be working at Amazon. So the area also has a lot to work on economically as well. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up another friend of mine, Miss Jessica Wong. She's a UMass She's a BCC alumni and UMass Amherst alumni, and she works with AmeriCorps Visa at United Neighbors of Fall River. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Wong. I was born and raised here in Fall River. I am a product of Fall River Public Schooling. I'm currently serving as an AmeriCorps member where I founded a young women's empowerment group called WAVE and also serve as a mentor at Family Service Association. Neither of my parents grew up in wealth. My father dropped out of traditional schooling at the age of 12 to work to support his family and friends. As a teenager, he enrolled in the Hong Kong Sea School, which was a boarding school for underprivileged boys. This school specifically targeted boys with family or academic problems and was seen as a school as, as a last resort. If they don't go here, they don't go anywhere. This school had a strong maritime background and tries to aid in the promotion of sea sports as well as additional opportunities to its students. This school allowed my father to travel the world and eventually making his way to the United States where he became a citizen in 1999. My mother never sought to pursue higher education. After school, she moved out on her own and worked in the factories here in Fall River, where she supported herself and was eventually fortunate enough to land a job right here at BCC, where she has been here for over 15 years. Both of my parents are extremely independent, hardworking individuals who did what they had to do to provide sustainable lives for my brothers and I. I am proud to say that I am the first in my family to graduate with an associate's degree right here from Bristol Community College <laughs> Thank you. and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. <laughs> no one ever pushed me to go to college, but society told us that we had to go to college in order to succeed in life. During my time at Durfee, I was accepted into the Upward Bound program also here at BCC. Upward Bound is a support group for low-income and first-generation students in preparation for college entrance. During my junior year at Durfee, Upward Bound took us on a tour of UMass Amherst. It wasn't until I stepped foot on that campus that I knew that this was the university for me. It was big, it was diverse, it was full of opportunities, and the food was amazing. I was always told that it was too expensive, a waste of time, and that I should just stay local but I was looking for opportunity, adventure, and new experiences. I made it a goal of mine to attend UMass Amherst. After graduating from Durfee, I attended BCC, where I enrolled in the Mass Transfer Program, which would guarantee my admission into UMass Amherst. During my first semester at UMass, I encountered my worst enemy, the bursar's office, the debt collector coming to collect their money. I had owed them $5,000 in fees, what fees? Why didn't anyone tell me about this? I didn't have $5,000 in my pocket. A fellow student had mentioned the same struggle of the semesterly bill, which she took care of through the Parent PLUS loan. I had no idea what the Parent PLUS loan was. To me, it was just more loans. Why do I have to take out more loans? So it was either pay up now, take out another loan, or get kicked out of school. Lo and behold, naive me, I took out the extra loans every semester, not fully knowing what the repercussions were. 
By 2014, I was walking across the stage, family in the crowd, face on the jumbotron, to receive a piece of paper worth $29,000. By 2015, I became an AmeriCorps member with Social Capital, Inc. I wanted to return to my hometown and give back to my community. I wanted to continue working with youth and provide them with the same opportunities that I had when I was younger. One of the many perks of being an AmeriCorps member is the Siegel Education Award. This award is awarded upon completion of service. The Siegel Education Award is used to help AmeriCorps alumni pay off student loans or pay educational costs at eligible educational institutions. AmeriCorps has been a huge stepping stone. I am always hearing about the incredibly high loans that students end up with. The average student loan amount in Massachusetts is $29,000. Having such high college costs and having more than half of the costs covered by loans instead of financial aid can be extremely burdensome to many and may be the reason why some of our friends and family members are turned off by pursuing a college education simply because it's not affordable. The choice of pursuing a college ed education should not be left to a state budget but instead the individual themselves. No one should need to ask themselves, can I afford this? We should not be making more cuts to our higher education budget. Instead, we need to invest more in education, in the education of our communities and make it more affordable to people. I 100% agree with Sabrina in that we need to work to support more funding for higher education through the Fair Share Tax Amendment. So make sure to vote in the November 2018 elections because I don't know about you, but I want affordable higher education for all. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Chad and I am a Youth Bill Forever student here in Forever, Massachusetts. Um, I think if they cut budget, I would not be a student here at Youth Bill Forever. Um, to be honest with you, I want to join NCCC uh, within the United States of America, and it helps a lot of people who are in need and who don't have an education like us. Now, if Donald Trump decides to cut that budget, who's going to fund that? Who's going to help all these millions of people out here in the United States of America who doesn't have a house, don't have money for food, or struggling with getting water out of their basements? Like, we're just going to sit here on our butts and be like, oh, it's, it's okay. The President of the United States of America doesn't care about our, our um, education. They care about people who don't even live in our country. Like, come on now. Like, Back then, before we were even born, we were the greatest country in the world. We were number one in technology, if I presume, like, come on now. Now you got other countries. Look at China. They're doing better than us. We were better than them. That's how we got Pearl Harbor. I mean, right? That's how Pearl Harbor even started, because... Japan. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> All right. But let's be real here. Come on now. The Youth Bill Forever helps a lot of people. We're right now building a tiny house for a veteran who doesn't have a home. We're building that for him from scratch, to be honest. <laughs> Without that, we wouldn't be able to do that. We built a room for river recovery. Without the funds, we don't have funds for that either. Education is one of the most important things in everybody's lives. Because without that, who's going to make another job? Who's going to build another company and raise it from the ground and raise it up? Who's going to make companies all over the world? Mind you, they come from America. Who's going to do that? can't with no budget, no education. I'm 23 years old. I should have graduated when I was 18. 
I got dropped because I missed about a month of school. Not consecutively, each and every day. They literally dropped me without anything. Didn't pull me aside and be like, hey, Chad, what's wrong? Are you struggling with something? Nope. Take him off the list. Get a phone call. Hi, Miss Almeida, your son got dropped. What am I going to do now? No education. From 18 all the way to 23, I did not know what to do. My first choice was go out and find a job. I had to lie on my application saying that I'm a graduate just to get a job. Just to get a job. Nobody wants to hire somebody who has no high school diploma. Nobody. I mean, you're going to make a job and hire somebody who has not learned anything? Or are you going to hire someone who knows more than that person without the high school diploma? Without an education, there's nothing. Nothing. And I just want to make that note. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to come up and say anything? Susan, no? Nothing? You want to say a little something? No? OK. <laughs> so I just want to take this time to thank everybody, all my speakers, Zach, <laughs> Jessica, Eric, and of, and of course, Sean. Thank you, and for everybody that got up to the open mic, it's great to have you here. I'm excited about rallying for public higher education. I hope you all continue to help us in the fight. And like um, Ada Bell and Sabrina mentioned, Fair Share Amendment, November 2018, get out and vote. And I hope you all can join the Coalition for Social Justice and Canvas and Phone Bank and, and Get that word out that we need this amendment to pass. I myself take the bus here, back and forth, every day to school. I myself can't go to Bridgewater State University, even though I want to major in an education field. I would love to go. It's cheaper, but I can't. There's no bus to get there. So I'm going to UMass Dartmouth. Um, it's unfortunate that there's only one public university that you can choose to get by bus to. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for coming out. I really appreciate it. Go BCC is phenomenal. And helping me pursue my dream in public service, as well as take some of the weight of student loans off my shoulders. Through the Trump administration's America's First budget, major cuts to complete elimination will be made into programs that helped shape me and the woman that I am today. You know. I had to take a step back and really think about that. The programs that helped me and so many others are on the verge of being gone. From the TRIO programs right here at BCC that include Upper Bound to the Corporation of Community and Public Service that runs AmeriCorps, absolutely gone. That's a really scary thought. While President Trump is also pursuing to reduce Fed federal financial aid and release the federal government from the responsibilities of student loan business and put it in the hands of private banks, making it more difficult for students to obtain loans and afford college. Let me be clear. If funding gets cut from educational institutions and programs, not only is it a disservice to its students, it purposely prevents from people progressing. It keeps people down. It keeps the economy down. Public higher education improves the quality of life. It puts people on the path towards health, empowerment, employment, and creating more peaceful societies. The only thing more expensive than investing in education is not investing in education. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. All right, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Sean Carnell. He's also a BCC alumni and UMass Dartmouth graduate, and he's the lead educator of the Fall River Youth Build program, and he brought some of his students here today as well. All right. So, um, got a lot to say. Um, so the idea of this, so first things first, my name is Sean Connell, 
and I am $66,000 in student loan debt, right? And I am tired of feeling ashamed about that, right? So there are so many issues that this touches upon that I really wanted to be able to take a minute here and talk about these issues. This to me is not just a public higher education issue. This is an issue through all of public schooling, right through kindergarten, all the way up to the college level. So I want to start a little bit about me, about who I am and why I'm actually here, so kind of contextualize my story a little bit. But I actually was born and raised in Fall River. I was a first generation college student. My father drove trucks and my mom worked at McDonald's, right? So we were very much so a working class family. My father got sick, started to drink a lot, divorce, poverty, and actually we're losing the fall of the family house this year. So clearly my family wasn't able to provide for me the way I needed to be provided for at a university where I went, which was UMass, uh, UMass Dartmouth, right? A public university, it's local, right? I thought that I would be okay coming out of high school. Out of high school, I was 11th in my class. I was president of National Honor Society. I had a 1900 on my SATs, right? I was a state officer for the National FFA organization, right? Future Farmers, I went to Bristol Aggie. Right? So the idea behind the fact that my first year, because I really wanted the experience of living on a college campus, so I wanted to go live at UMass Dartmouth thinking that it's local, so it would be somewhat cheap. My first year, I had to take out $15,000 in loans for one year to live on campus. Pell Grants covered some, I had some scholarships that covered some, but the rest of it had to be covered in loans. Again, like you know, people had mentioned, I was young, I was naive. I had no idea how the loan process actually worked, and no one cared to explain it to me. My mother had a hard time just filling out the financial aid forms because she herself had never been to college, so how was she supposed to be able to know these really advanced government forms if she herself had never actually had to endure this, right? The idea behind my financial aid package, I don't know how you guys how it works, they calculate what's called an estimated family contribution, your EFC. Right, my EFC was zero, right? I lived with my mom who was divorced and she was disabled. So they didn't expect that I would be able to put any money in to my own education. But yet, on my first year, I took out $15,000 in loans. My first year, because of a clerical error, which I learned later, right? Because they didn't have me living down on campus, but I did say that I was living on campus, so they had to backfill my aid with loans not scholarships. So it became a situation where I really wanted to pursue higher education, but I knew that debt was gonna follow me. And honestly, I was terrified. I had no idea what I wanted to do about this debt, how I was gonna figure this debt out, what I wanted to do. And throughout public education, which is where I wanna start this story, throughout my public education, I was told go and get a job that you can produce money. Right, so anything else was inconsequential, right? So I double majored in political science and gender studies. Do you know how much crap I got for majoring in gender studies, right? I literally had people come up to me in my face and said, why on God's green earth would you study that, right? But for me, I understood as a gay individual, I understood that identity politics affects who gets money and where that money goes. And one of the problems in Massachusetts is that money's not going to public schools. I actually want to take a step back and look at last November. Ballot question number two, right? Ballot question number two was a corporate disguise, right? They asked for an increase in the amount of charters that we could have in the state, but we weren't even at the limit for charters. So why were you asking for that? And what they were doing, which was really kind of insidious, they were preying on people's distrust of education because education is crumbling. So it's not that these students or these people or these parents hate their public schools the way it was pushed in that ballot initiative. They wanted in public education that was funded, that allowed teachers to teach, that allowed students to examine the world in positive ways, in ways that are unique and not standardized. I actually was recently out of forum about standardized testing. We're now testing kindergartners, kindergartners, five years old. 170 hours a year of standardized testing. A year. I've actually talked to teachers who are terrified to say this out loud because they're afraid of losing their jobs. 
But what's happening is, is that's actually destroying my students' love of education. They come to me at Youth Build, right? They've come from the public schools. I work with the kids that the public schools forgot. So I'm listening to their conversations. And when I listen to them, I hear that they were told, this is the test, this is how you answer the questions, and anything else is not acceptable. The answers are in the back of the book, by the way, but you can't look at those. Right, so it became a situation where students actually valued getting a higher grade than they actually valued learning. And that's translating all the way through high school into the college level. At that same forum, that high stakes forum, there was an enrollment person from BCC who talked about that enrollment is down at BCC. And even those who are enrolling, who have endured 180 hours of testing, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and then it counts in 10th, right? They endured all of that testing and they still can't test into a college math or English class, right? Because they don't know how to critically think or critically examine things. They don't understand concepts around divergent thinking and how you can look at a problem and look at an answer in a lot of different ways. Standardized tests don't do that. Right? They tell you this is the answer and that's it. Teaching the GED to my kids, I hate. Right? I have to teach them what answer is most correct. The hell is that right? What is most correct? You either have an option that makes sense that you can defend with a critical thinking kind of arc where you can connect information to your real life experiences. I don't need my kids to rogue memorize dates for a standardized test that doesn't do anything for their love of education, it doesn't foster their, pa their passion for learning, and it is making them not want to go to college, right? And it's happening every day. And then the kids who I do manage to get to go to college, they are up against all of these institutions that they've never had to deal with. All these loan paperwork offices, the financial aid offices, the enrollment, the bursars, the registrar. It's a really complicated system. And I think a lot of our proposals that we've seen floating around is tuition free, tuition free. Just to paint a picture for that, UMass Dartmouth is $20,000 a year to live on campus. $785 is tuition, right? $785 out of $20,000 is tuition. The rest of it, fees. Right? Gym fee, athletic fee, computer fee, library fee, maintenance fee, construction fee, printing fee, right? All of these things. And then books on top of that, books are not included, right? Books are the biggest scam I've ever seen. Even if I can get my students to get into BCC and get a Pell Grant and pay for their college, now how do they pay for the $700 book that's required? I had to buy a book my freshman year for my biology class. It was $650. At the end of the semester, he offered me zero because a new edition was coming out. I checked the new edition. New edition had four additional pages, right? Textbook like this, four additional pages, $600 to buy, $0 to return. That's an enormous problem. And I think Amy is right when she speaks about inclusivity. It shouldn't be about having a good GPA. It shouldn't be about what you can prove on a standardized test. Because my students and all of us as students are not standardized people. We don't learn in the same ways, we don't understand in the same ways, and we don't demonstrate our knowledge in the same ways. We all have different processes for this. So why are we saying that there's one way or the highway? It is destroying our love of education. So you have to understand that the importance of public education was meant to be a tool for social mobility. The idea that if you pursue what you're passionate about, you can carve and create a path for yourself and even a job for yourself. But when I majored in political science and gender studies, I did it because I was passionate about it and I loved it. I had no idea what I was going to do for a career because everyone who told me to push for a career seemed really unhappy in the careers that they ended up having to be in, right, with billing information. They were not in a job that are necessarily bad, but certainly not jobs that, I, that would unlock anything passion that I had. Right, so that's what I wanted to be able to do. And after college, with 66,000, I'm sorry, to be exact, it's $66,167, um, and I did just pay $400 the last two months, because now I got an income-based repayment plan. So here's the thing where this kind of diverges in the road. There are some options for us. There are. So for instance, I work at YouthBuild, which is a nonprofit, and I'm, el and I'm eligible for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Plan. Right? I didn't even know that was a thing. 
right? And when I graduated from college, I hid. I was terrified of my loans and I didn't know what to do about it. And UMass Dartmouth held some of my loans because I got a loan from UMass Dartmouth itself. But then the federal government held the rest of my loans. And then lo and behold, I wasn't up to date with my loans. They actually took my taxes this year while my house was being foreclosed, right? So I actually had to write a letter of appeal saying, I need my taxes. I didn't know that I was any, even in default with you because I thought my loans were held with UMass and I was fine with them. Totally different loan company through the federal government. Right, so there's all these kind of different places that are funding us. And then on top of that, then some of us have private loans. Sally Mae or any of those other type of loans, that's an additional loan holder. So at that point, I would have, if I had to take out a private loan, I would have had a private loan, a public loan, and a UMass Dartmouth loan to fund my public education, right, where I could take something and create something for the community. But the only way I was able to do that when I graduated was just like Jess, I became an AmeriCorps VISTA, which was a volunteer in service to America. I also didn't finish my courses because my financial aid was running out because I was a first generation college student. I made a whole lot of bad decisions, right? Especially since I saw public education so broken that I could, I literally learned how to write an eight page paper in my sleep. Right, you write this eight page paper and you put in the quotes and you put your citations and you're done. Right, it didn't actually challenge me and do the things that I wanted and so I made some other bad decisions and as I got out, I had no idea what to do. So I found AmeriCorps and I used, I did AmeriCorps for a year for the scholarship at the end. They give a $5,550 scholarship for every year you complete. And I completed that year, I used that money to finish the classes that I needed to finish to complete my degree. When I completed my degree and I completed about a half of my second VISTA term, a teacher position became available at YouthBuild, and I was originally teaching social studies and, and English. Funding changed, because and this is what I'm about to get into, is this funding issue. Funding changed and I became the only teacher for 44 students. 44 students and I taught math, science, social studies, reading and writing, and life skills. Right, so it became a situation where our students were clearly being overlooked. We had over 115 applicants that year for my Youth Build program, which means the kids who are the ages between 16 and 24 who've dropped out of school are eligible for our program, right? We could not serve even half of them, right? So now we're actually having a huge problem right now because under the current budget, under Trump's budget, AmeriCorps and Youth Build is put at zero, zero, right? So that would mean not a cut, that would mean our doors would close. This is a huge conversation that we need to have. And I need us to make no mistake, under Trump's budget, we are exchanging bombs for books. That's what's happening. We have decided that as a nation, our priority should be with the military, even though our military consumes half of our budget. And it's not making the world more safe, it's making the world more dangerous. Terrorist attacks have actually been on the rise exponentially since 9-11. Meanwhile, enrollment at BCC is dropping, and we're trying to sell the public on, oh, we'll have this tuition-free thing. But tuition-free is not enough. It wasn't enough for me. My tuition was covered through the John Abigail Adams Scholarship. Didn't matter. $700, $20,000 bill. Right? It wasn't as helpful as the politicians would like you to believe that it is. And then meanwhile, we're taking all of this energy and all this attitude and we're blaming immigrants. And we're saying, oh, the people who are coming here are trying to make their lives better, yeah, they're the ones who are causing our budget problems. So we're gonna spend $15 billion to keep them out. Mind you, $15 billion, I did the math, that would run my youth build program for the next 230 years. Right? So that's the kind of trade-off that we're making when we make these decisions around public education. So I want us to be really, 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 really intentional today. I want us to be able to go back to our communities and activate. We no longer can be bystanders in the face of the crises that we're facing. We are literally losing our lives. We're losing our education. We're losing our opportunities. We're losing our dignity over priorities that a majority of the country didn't even vote for, right? And education around political science, I think is one of the most misrepresented sciences out there. Political science is science, right? It's not a liberal conspiracy that we spend half of our budget on the military, that's math. 
right? We spend 50% of our money on the military, right? You count the numbers, that's how it works out, right? So there are a lot of problems there. So I totally want to take some questions in a minute. I would love that. Um, I just want to kind of finish this last note that we have to have priorities and we're not prioritizing education. And that is a huge concern for me. But I want to, yeah, what you got? I'd rather have, like, have, a, have the money being spent equally. It's better than getting educated as good, but I'd rather be safe than be blown up by, by ISIS. That's true, right? So, but if you think about this from a contextual standpoint, from a historical standpoint, right? We have been attacked on our soil twice. By right? But yeah, absolutely, sure. By twice. Last year alone, we dropped 57,000 bombs on Syria. Right? So we attacked them 57,000 times because we were attacked once. Right? That's like if I were to slap you in the face and then you blow up my house. Right? It's a disproportionate level of priority. And I would love to see the military funded at the same level of education, because that would mean education would get $75 billion a year, which we don't. Right? Not even close. We're fighting to hit a billion in funding. And it's constantly being cut. So one of the ways I'm getting involved is I'm actually, this is actually my soft announcement for I'm running for school committee in Fall River, here in Fall River. Because I need our schools to connect to the economy and realize that an undereducated population, a population that can't go to a community college or a university, is a community that will constantly fall down. It is a constant struggle to ever stand back up when you don't have legs to do it on. Public education is the legs that we stand on. So without further ado, I thank you guys so much. But to quote one of my favorite inspirational people, Harvey Milk, this is 2017. My name is Sean Connell, and I am here to recruit you. Get involved. Stay involved. When I was at UMass Dartmouth, tuition and fees went up every single year I was there, seven years in a row. We have to stop that. We have to fight back. We have to make clear what our priorities are. And one of our number one priorities has to be education. Thank you guys so much. All right, well. <laughs> Sorry about it. No, it's OK. That's why I picked you. So did I have some good speakers or what? Let's give everybody a round of a hand. And I just want to mention, because Jessica didn't mention it, but I'm going to mention it for her. Jessica's also running for schools committee. So two BCC alumni and UMass grads in political science running for school committee in the city of Fall River. Wow, so there was, there was a lot to say, and everybody's speaking. So now I want to open the floor up for an open mic for anybody that wants to get up and speak and say what's on their mind. Sabrina, you want to? All right. Sabrina Davis. She's with Coalition for Social Justice. Hi, my name is Sabrina Davis, and I'm a, a, an organizer. Still strange to say that. Um, I just, just got hired to the Coalition for Social Justice as an organizer after volunteering for three years. Um, I was pretty fortunate in that despite my family coming from absolute poverty that I was able to finagle from scholarships and grants that I only needed $3,000 in loans, um, which I'm paying off slowly. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to have that debt looming over you. And I would have liked to have gone farther than just my associates. But when I went to go check it out to get my bachelor's degree at Bridgewater State University, I realized after doing the math, the total cost was in the ballpark of $90,000. And I had no parental support, not because they didn't want to, it's just there was, they couldn't. I mean, we're renters. It's not like they could take a second mortgage out on the house. And so that, that was a really rough decision, uh, knowing that my family couldn't afford to help me and I'd most likely be getting into debt that I could probably never pay off because as much as I love my job, it's my passion, it's my life. It's not the kind of job that you make millions of dollars at, even though I'm paid very well. Part of what it made it so expensive for me 
is the fact that there's no bus going to Bridgewater State University. It's ridiculous, it's fairly close. There's no connecting buses there. And so over half of those fees that I'd have to pay was just in boarding alone. And mind you, when I did the research uh, then versus now, uh, the ballpark of $90,000 is from projected from now. It was, it was around 85,000 when I first checked out, and now it's 90,000. And that's just a basic estimate, and they're saying it's gonna rise even more. This is a huge problem because access is everything. If you don't have access to education, you don't have access to a great job. One thing that is great about my position is I get paid to work on issues that I care about. And one of the things that we have going on is called the Fair Share Amendment. And so this is a an amendment where we'd have to amend our constitution to put a special tax on people who make over a million dollars in income every year, about 4%. So that way we can generate over, uh, close to $2 billion in revenues to go towards transportation and education, which goes hand in hand when you come from a background like I come from. So the, the bill, the, Amendment is going to be coming up, fingers crossed, in 2018. I hope you all look for it in the ballot. It's super important. We're super underfunded, especially from our, our gov on a government, uh, federal gov government level. But this is a chance to put, get funding back and put it back into our education. If we were a country, we'd be the third richest in Massachusetts. It's just a little fun fact. So. If you really want to make a difference, go out, go vote, come this November. Um, thank you so much. A couple quick things. What Sean touched on, the public service loan forgiveness program, uh, Betsy DeVos and Donald Trump are trying to end that program. So people who have been in for nine years, who are supposed to, in their 10th year, get their loans forgiven because they worked in public service, might not get that now. Um, and also, Quickly on the fair share amendment, uh, the top 1% of people in Massachusetts pay a 6% tax rate, and the bottom 99%, I think that's probably everyone here, we pay a 9% tax rate. So we actually pay more as a percentage of our income in taxes being regular working people than the really rich people in Massachusetts pay. So I just wanted to echo that, that's a really important, the fair share amendment is what we're hoping to get debt free higher education from. So. Very important, and Coalition for Social Justice is also a great organization that we work with. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Annabelle Santiago, and I am a organizer at the Coalition for Social Justice. I recently just got hired, like Sabrina. And I'm also a BCC student, and I'm hoping to transfer to UMass Dartmouth and I can tell you that financial aid and loans has been a big and stressful part of the process. Since 2001, our state has cut back on its support for higher education. We have experienced a cut of 14% in the total budget, leading to a 31% or $3,000 cut per student since 2001. Since then, the cost of attending college have increased. Tuition and fees have made an increase of 4,000 per student on all campuses, and in community colleges, the increase has been 2,500. In 2001, students used to pay about a third of their higher education costs. Students today pay more than half of their higher education costs. Over half of the states of the United States spend more in higher education than Massachusetts, which ranks 30th place. As a share of the economy, Massachusetts also spends less on higher education. We rank 43rd in higher education support per $1,000 of personal income. So what do all these numbers mean? Well, let me tell you. They mean that students like myself, 
who want to pursue a college education can only do so with the result of thousands of dollars in student loans. I come from a poor background, and I remember being in middle school and in high school always questioning whether or not if a college education was attainable for me. My family surely did not have the money. I remember applying to four-year colleges, both private and public, and seeing the amount of loans that I would need to take out for just one year of school. I remember thinking, I can't put my family through that. Isn't that crazy? I can't put my family through me getting a college education. I am always hearing about the incredibly high loans that students end up with. The average student loan amount in Massachusetts is $29,000. Having such high college costs and having more than half of the costs covered by loans instead of financial aid can be extremely burdensome to many and may be the reason why some of our friends and family members are turned off by pursuing a college education simply because it's not affordable. The choice of pursuing a college ed education should not be left to a state budget, but instead the individual themselves. No one should need to ask themselves, can I afford this? We should not be making more cuts to our higher education budget. Instead, we need to invest more in education, in the education of our communities, and make it more affordable to people. I 100% agree with Sabrina in that we need to work to support more funding for higher education through the Fair Share Tax Amendment. So make sure to vote in the November 2018 elections because I don't know about you, but I want affordable higher education for all. Hi everyone. My name is Chad and I am a Youth Bill Forever student here in Forever, Massachusetts. Um, I think if they cut budget, I would not be a student here at Youth Bill Forever. Um, to be honest with you, I want to join NCCC uh, within the United States of America and it helps a lot of people who are in need and who don't have an education like us. Now, if Donald Trump decides to cut that budget, who's going to fund that? Who's going to help all these millions of people out here in the United States of America who doesn't have a house, don't have money for food, or struggling with getting water out of their basements? Like, we're just going to sit here on our butts and be like, oh, it's, it's okay. The President of the United States of America doesn't care about our, our um, education. They care about people who don't even live in our country. Like, come on now. Like, Back then, before we were even born, we were the greatest country in the world. We were number one in technology, if I presume, like, come on now. Now you got other countries. Look at China. They're doing better than us. We were better than them. That's how we got Pearl Harbor. I mean, right? That's how Pearl Harbor even started, because Japan. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> All right. But let's be real here. Come on now. The Youth Build Forever helps a lot of people. We're right now building a tiny house for a veteran who doesn't have a home. We're building that for him. From scratch, to be honest. <laughs> Without that, we wouldn't be able to do that. We built a room for river recovery. Without the funds, we don't have funds for that either. Education is one of the most important things in everybody's lives. Because without that, who's going to make another job? Who's going to build another company and raise it from the ground and raise it up? Who's going to make companies all over the world? Mind you, they come from America. Who's going to do that? can't with no budget, no education. I'm 23 years old. I should have graduated when I was 18. I got dropped because I missed 
about a month of school. Not consecutively, each and every day. They literally dropped me without anything. Didn't pull me aside and be like, hey, Chad, what's wrong? Are you struggling with something? Nope. Take them off the list. Get a phone call. Hi, Miss Almeida, your son got dropped. What am I going to do now? No education. From 18 all the way to 23, I did not know what to do. My first choice was go out and find a job. I had to lie on my application saying that I'm a graduate just to get a job. Just to get a job. Nobody wants to hire somebody who has no high school diploma. Nobody. I mean, you're going to make a job and hire someone who has not learned anything? Or are you going to hire someone who knows more than that person without the high school diploma? Without an education, there's nothing. Nothing. And I just want to make that note. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to come up and say anything? Susan, no? Nothing? Want to say a little something? No? Okay. <laughs> so I just want to take this time to thank everybody, all my speakers, Zach, <laughs> Jessica, Eric, and of, and of course, Sean. Thank you, and for everybody that got up to the open mic, it's great to have you here. I'm excited about rallying for public higher education. I hope you all continue to help us in the fight. And like um, Edda Bell and Sabrina mentioned, Fair Share Amendment, November 2018, get out and vote. And I hope you all can join the Coalition for Social Justice and Canvas and Phone Bank and, and Get that word out that we need this amendment to pass. I myself take the bus here, back and forth, every day to school. I myself can't go to Bridgewater State University, even though I want to major in an education field. I would love to go. It's cheaper, but I can't. There's no bus to get there. So I'm going to UMass Dartmouth. Um, it's unfortunate that there's only one public university that you can choose to get by bus to. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for coming out. I really appreciate it. Go BCC is phenomenal.